How, how are you doing, Rebecca? Yeah, I'm well. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Is the good. echo still there? No. For the delay? Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, we'll start just the conversation. So, um, yeah, that's the point we might put the, the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> Imagine Action Podcast. Imagination. Creando comunità trasformative. Imagination. Social arts across borders. Live not che hilot transformative. Building transformative communities for future. Nosotros creemos que la imaginación es el derecho universal. Podcast de imagination. We believe imagination is our universal right and regeneration is our collective responsibility. I started this podcast um, over a year ago with this social arts across borders, interviewing social artists, facilitators, um, kind of curious about the life journey of different people into this work. But then, uh, you know, gradually this kind of evolved uh, for me and it moved to kind of trying to understand some of the questions that surround this uh, practice or this field. Um, and um, yeah, Nico also is joining the podcast team. He, he has his own podcast, but we're also collaborating on this kind of uh, Imagine Action podcast. Um, and yeah, our last conversation was actually with this, um, really interesting, you know, ex psychologist, I don't know, Dr. Daniel Four, who was actually started a school about ancestral healing and yeah, it was great because, you know, um, I think what Daniel was bringing, uh, in that, the conversation is this kind of the, the, the world, which might not see itself as arts connecting with the arts and what can the arts bring to other worlds and how is it connected so i think i think like um they, we asked like several questions and people can listen in to the previous podcast about kind of the healing arts and the theater and, and the connection with the ancestral work between that and 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 uh, so you know so anyway people can listen to that but i think it's exciting so i uh, rebecca and I met through the social field summer school by the Prensing Institute in Berlin. And um, um, I was in your presentation, which was about participatory uh, research, which was awesome. And also, I think we connected in some other kind of, of the practices part. Um, and um, yeah, I, I just, you know, I, we had several conversation about research and collective well-being and um, recently, also, I know that you published a book about the purposeful PhD and started an organization about collective well-being, and um, and you're also being a guest in our new mentoring program, which starts this week. And um, so, I guess the conversation uh, can go different ways, um, but maybe I, I'll start it off like maybe you can share more about. Uh, who you are and how you got to do what you do, your work today, and how would you even define your work? Um, and then how do you relate with this idea of social arts? Where do you see the, your work intersecting there? Yeah, well, thanks, Yuri. That's a, hmm, so many different places to kind of dive in. Um, maybe I'll start with the path, how I got here. I mean, it definitely wasn't the path that I planned out step by step and then arrived at this destination it, it felt like it unfolded in front of me which was so exciting that wasn't really how I was that wasn't how I was raised so I, there was a more a, a more scripted field you do this you do this it results in that and I think it was I was doing my doctoral studies and I I, honestly, I had done it because I liked I liked the kind of research that I learned was possible, that we talked about participatory research. And in some ways, for me, that meant, given my field in, in social work, I was still able to, to talk with people, to be with people in community, to ask, what is the problem in this moment? How do we work collaboratively to co-create solutions? So it didn't 
feel like the mental model I had for research, but it didn't, in my mind, necessarily mean that I wanted to be a professor. And there's a, a, a dominant narrative among doctoral education in the United States, and certainly in among many folks I've spoke with in Europe as well, that the doctoral education is a direct route to professorship. And not just any professorship, but in the States we call tenure professorship, which essentially means that you have um, guaranteed employment at your place of your university for a lifetime, assuming you don't do anything that's truly unethical. And that's a fine path for a lot of folks. It's not a realistic path for a lot of people for many reasons. And this kind of goes into my book, which is saying that what we know is that the most recent data we have shows in the United States, only 7% of people who graduate with a doctoral degree have that 10 year track job lined up at the time that they graduate. And many of, you know, there's others that will go on and get it, but for the other 93% of us, it leaves this question of, well, so then what? And it's, and it's layered on with a lot of grief and a sense of failure, depending on you know, the values of the organization. So I'm rambling, but the point being, I didn't, I didn't fall neatly into that category of wanting that, of that professor job. And so I thought, okay, well, what am I gonna do? And I got some good advice at the time that I graduated from a colleague who said, you know, just test out working in as many different fields, sectors, private sector, nonprofit, government, community, and see what feels good. You know, maybe you pick pieces from lots of them and design something later on. And, and that's what I did. I worked in the tech kind of uh, startup field. I worked in public health and government. I directed um, nonprofit work, which might be akin to like NGOs in an international context. I had a small business, I did consulting, and really got a sense of what I liked in different industries, what I didn't like. And the fact is, at the end of the day, I felt like the piece that was most compelling to me about any work was always the people and the environment. And there was a lot that was lacking in terms of a sense that the well-being of people who worked within those organizations mattered. Um, there was often a narrative that the well-being of the people that we kind of did uh, were in service of or did business for, depending on the interest, their well-being mattered. Um, but our well-being felt like um, kind of forgotten. And so I felt very strongly that I, I didn't want to work like that anymore. I was burnt out from working full time, parenting, caring for my parents who were dying, and thinking, this is a recipe for disaster. And I'm really going to be in a place where I'm not going to be of benefit to many people if I'm this uh, burnt out, just saying it nicely, you know? And so I thought, okay, what am I going to do? And that's when I started doing some consulting work around a lot of the work I do today around really reimagining what's possible in organizations, um, working with organizations to support them with consulting around evaluation, asking what are your metrics for what you call success? Is it just that you've you know, done a, you know, a service or a presentation or served a hundred people, or is it th that those under, uh, those hundred people actually got something out of it that was of value to them? You know, so really asking different questions. And I, at that point, bumped up against some colleagues who were connected with the Presencing Institute, and Gary talked about how that's where we connected. So out of, uh, affiliated with MIT School of Business, really using some, I think, transformational social technologies um, that got me out of the, out of the kind of stuck mindset of some of these words we throw around, like participatory, which are really good in theory, but in practice often still have real issues with power differentials and are, are kind of beholden to the values of, in my case, the university setting or whomever it is that's in that position of power. I didn't want to do that anymore. And I really didn't know how to do differently and do anything differently. And so I really felt it was the, the Presencing Institute that gave me some new tools and mindsets for thinking differently about what was possible. And through that work, I met with our kind of local hub for the Presencing Institute and met now my co-founder and co-director of the Institute for Collective Wellbeing, which I co-founded. Um, so that's Stephen Gilchrist. And he and I, together with his 
really deep knowledge and profound knowledge of Theory U and the President Bing Institute that he had interwoven into a graduate uh, program here in Madison, Wisconsin, where I'm located, um, along with my use of a lot of the um, activities and models that are within that kind of suite of um, tools that the, the President Bing Institute has kind of joined forces to say, okay, there is a profound desire to think differently about what's possible in communities and organizations and in society. And this was pre-COVID and not, but not very much pre-COVID. And then COVID happened and it was like, this is our moment, you know, not, not to, you know, there's of course, I, you know, nobody wishes COVID would happen and we needed to wake up. Like we needed to collectively wake up to the moment that these systems, that whatever system around us are not working. And so this was an opportunity then to say, okay, not just, okay, not just bash systems. Okay, so then what are the tools? What are the tools that support transformation? Some of it's just allowing ourselves to think differently. So I, so we arrived, you know, so the, I guess to say, I, yeah, I never thought I'd be co-founding this and I can't imagine doing anything else because I felt so stuck in, kind of these systems I've been in before. And, and where the book plays in is simply that, yeah, I found people who I went to graduate school with, including, you know, colleagues, faculty coming to me and saying, well, would you, would you mentor this student who is a doctoral student and doesn't want to do the tenure track? We don't really know what to do in terms of mentorship. I, okay, sure. This kept happening, you know, and I, and I kept talking to people, doctoral students, current, past, people who've done doctoral education a long time ago, like in every field, it's not just social work, it's in engineering, it's in biotech, it's in math, it's in psychology who are saying, I am grieving because I feel like I failed. I feel like I, I was told this was the assignment. <laughs> you do this degree and then you become a professor. And for whatever reason, the job wasn't there or I just don't want to be one, or I don't want writing to be my vehicle for impact publication. It didn't work, but I don't know what to do. And um, I don't know what had given me the kind of the audacity to think that, mm, that I could just do whatever. <laughs> that's, that's audacity. I mean, to think there's a real clear narrative in my mind about how all the tools and skills we learned in you know, PhD school could be applied, but that was what I was seeing. If I could make the case to, to employers, no matter the field, that I understood what they valued, it wasn't about my ego. I wasn't going to go in there and try to like PhD school them. You know, I was going to care about what they cared about. Not only was it not a barrier, but it was an asset. And that's what I hear now from people who have transitioned away from academia and who are working with their PhD in lots of different fields, how exciting it is to rewrite that narrative. So that the book is about rewriting that narrative and especially around moving away from the path of the, the, the tenure track ideal as a career is at the center of all our choices and then everything else has to fall around that. Where we live, whether we have kids or whether we delay kids, if we have a partner, where they live or if they take a job or don't take a job, if we have time for hobbies, et cetera, et cetera that model to the tenure tracker, any career is one piece in the, in the many pieces of our lives. And what centers those pieces is our sense of purpose, our values and the, the impact we wanna have, the, the tools we wanna use for sharing our purpose. And I think that's where, it, for me, the social arts come into play. And I, and I use social arts perhaps um, to, for in my context to be more on that, that embodiment side of things, so how do I, and this is really hard because the values of the academy are so wedded and tied to reason and data and what is, you could, what can you prove? What is, what is fact? And I, being the qualitative and deeply intuitive person that I am, struggled because that it didn't, that didn't count. Right, they didn't count as being real a, a real source of information. Now, out in the world where I feel like I have a sense of agency in terms of bringing to life stories and systems and problems in a way that feels 
authentic to who I am and what I know to be true for me. It's not about, you know, convincing anybody, but these embodied practices and the um, allowance for and nurturing of this intuitive spirit, that's how I interpret social arts within my work. And certainly I'm every day feeling a deep calling to do more of that, to, uh, to put reason down for a second, give it a break, does good stuff, and say, what is emerging in this moment that can't be explained at that, that level of, of data and reason? So that is, that's, I guess, that's kind of the answer to all of those, I think, pieces in one. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, that's that's. Um, yeah, I think I think you you hit a lot of a lot of check marks in in terms of what also my experience has been. Uh, although, I I I did actually my university uh, path started uh, in theater studies and but in university so not in acting school. Um, but um, at, at some point, I, I even I didn't get to the PhD. I left a little earlier, even I wasn't doing the masters, and I wasn't fulfilled. Um, and and mostly, I felt like I'm not walking my own path in a way. I I was kind of I was following the I I didn't realize that, um, but my father died, and that kind of was a, a strong mirror into how much um, I was still following his path. So my father was a university professor in a completely other field of ecology um, and, and biology, ecology of systems. And, but then, you know, I just was really, oh, I was, I, it was just kind of in my head as that's, and even if it's a completely different field that, you know, you go to university, you become a professor. <laughs> that's just how life is, you know, it, that's, um, and, and that I was actually, there was a part of me that was really suffering from all this writing down stuff and, and, and was just eager to action. It was just, he wanted to go out there and do stuff and don't want to justify its, its sources, <laughs> written sources, uh, nice. but rather, you know, really have the experience. Um, that said, you know, I, I feel university is a privilege and was an amazing experience, both socially and also intellectually. And I still kind of source out from that period in many ways. Uh, and I think it's a privilege, you know, also because you know a lot of people in the world don't have even access to to that. And that that could be like a huge yeah, a huge thing. So um, mm -hmm. and and I am I'm a, I'm also in the process of kind of seeing how can I can back and contribute to that world or bridge into that world. Um, um, so it, it's not necessarily what I'm asking you, but I think it's great that, to have this conversation. And um, and also I'll ask Nico to, to pitch in soon if he wants to. But yeah, just saying more about the mentoring program and maybe the ALT PhD conversation we had, you know, the alter what is the alternative PhD? What could it be? Um, imagining somehow like what what can this um, what is can new academy look like really um, yeah that that's kind of what's coming out in my head um, but yeah, yeah I, I I also wonder Nico how how is yeah. how is that sounds to you <laughs> well to me I think it's always um, a, a great pleasure to to network with other people artists and Listen to Rebecca speaking. To me, it's like um, I don't know. I, I describe myself very, um, very lucky maybe to be here in, in Europe, um, from Zimbabwe, a very poor country, less education. Most of the stuff I educated myself. Um, everything I do, yeah. But to to get to this network, I think it's give me more. Um, actually, yeah, more boost to to understand how life, artist life works. Mm, well. Uh, for me, sometimes I'm scared of myself because I look, I look back like, why is this happening? How can, how can I do this? What's happening? You know, um, I have to actually enjoy it and then get on with it. Um, I think uh, what on the mental side, I think actually we do, all of us, we do need to have those conversations. Because like, sometimes I think I'm doing well, but I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, um, like yesterday we had a good show. 
but something inside me was not is not good it's never been enough you know i don't know if you know what i mean like when you do performance it's always you want to do much much more better so i don't know i think the mental program it might help to actually learn how to balance not to not to need more but just have that balance and as well i like the way it, uh, Zaruka was saying about rethinking and learn how to think um that's the one thing that i need to work on that but yeah i like actually as i said i like talking to people um in my podcast i talk a lot to, about refugees and asylum seekers because i'm part of them so it's, it's like it's like my uh, my journey as well so i thought if our voices can be heard and raising awareness as well so that yeah in a moment i've got this year i tried not to to do a lot of things i've got stand up comedy planning to go to edinburgh edinburgh is like the big fringe like in august a thousand thousand people there so i'm hoping to get a space this year and do podcasts and of course some drama groups here so i'm, I'm just fit into this world of artists i'm new so i'm not like really experienced much but so far i'm enjoying it and special meeting you yeah yep. thank you so, Nico. any questions i'm here so to I was going to say, you both touched on this, and it's very real in my family, this, this question also of privilege of education. And so to be clear, it's, it's definitely not about a, like a whole school kind of write off of, of high, especially a higher education we're talking about here. Um, my, fat, my, my husband's family, my, my husband was born in Colombia, he's from the Pacific coast. So it's Afro-Colombian. And he's the only person in his family to go to college to end up coming here. And so that, that narrative is very present in our home too, as we think about both the frustrations of higher education, but also the clear privilege and what it's meant in my family. So I, I appreciate as I get on my high horse and start talking about all the things that are wrong <laughs> to also recognize um, what it's meant in very real terms, which mean that he can be here, we're able to have the family together, which education was that vehicle for us. So there is that. I, and I think when I talk about kind of dismantling systems, sometimes it's not about the idea of um, you know, burning it to the ground. Sometimes the biggest, um, the, uh, the, how do I say this? Sometimes it, the, a fundamental shift is in mindset and in purpose. So the, the coursework, for example, could be the same. Let's say there's a doctoral program. The coursework could be the same, but the questions we ask ourselves about what's the purpose of what this is leading to is different. And so, so one of the hats I wear is as an evaluator. And this is where the framing of the questions, I feel like I should grab my book because the last, the last section of the book is really about reimagining higher ed and, and what are the metrics we're using to determine if it's you know quote unquote successful you know right now it's the number of, of graduates who get professorships or the number of scholarly publications those are those are very kind of specific types of metrics the metrics that i'm interested in are um what was the sense of satisfaction with the relationships you had with whether it's advisors or colleagues do doctoral students have a sense of what their their possibilities are if in terms of mul multiple career paths? So those are just a couple of examples. There's many more of them and, and far more interesting if you actually start having conversations with people about what they want from that experience. So shifting a narrative shifts values as well to say that if that professorship doesn't work out, it's fine because it's not the it's not the end game. So I, I, there's 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 that piece, and then the, the other piece that kind of came up for me about the arts component. I realized my book is written in a in a, in a voice that's a lot more authentically myself. I've you know published academic articles, and that's a very different voice. That's very there's a lot of jargon and all the data and citations, and it's it's fine. This 
is a shift toward me finding my own voice. And there's artistry in that. I really enjoy writing like that. And I'm actually going now as I'm writing a piece that's more like um, like an opinion piece for more like popular consumption about the book. It's even more in my voice. And it's so thrilling to, to be untethered to what was told to me was how I needed to write. And, I, and I'll, the one example I'll give, I don't know if I put this in the book or not, but I, it was, I don't think I did. It was very telling and, and also really affected me. I remember a paper I wrote, I what it was about, one of my early doctoral classes. And I started a sentence with, I feel, you know, there was a huge red line over feel and it said, that's not a fact. You can't talk in an academic paper from that place of feeling. But it, for me, it was just like wholesale consumption. Uh, okay, sure, cross it out. Um, the, the literature says I didn't. I didn't even question it, right? I was just like I was on that path. Super easy. Now I look back and I'm thinking, that's an intense comment to make. That writes off a whole belief system, a whole way of knowing, feeling, being in the world that is so counter to the person who I want to be that I just didn't know. Um, and Yuri, like you, my parents both died in the last couple of years. And I, again, not that you would wish for it, obviously. And yet there's something about that, that kind of like snapped me out of some of the patterned ways of thinking about myself. Not that they had told me to do that, but it was a, an archetype as a daughter and, and a quote unquote good daughter to, to, to do that. And so when that was gone, that part of me also died. And so it's this reimagining who I could be if I could speak from my own voice, if I could believe that what I say matters, whether or not I have a citation behind it, whether or not I'm an expert in that particular field that I'm talking about, it's not like revolutionary stuff, but it feels like, it feels like it after being told for so long to basically stay in your own lane, only talk about stuff that you've published about. So yeah, that's coming up for me is the writing for me now being a real, a different type of writing being such a powerful tool for healing, but also for reimagining in a way that I haven't done before. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great. Um, we just had a sort of uh, workshop conversation I organized. Uh, so I, I work in Italy um, um, with a project that has to do with social and work inclusion of migrants or foreign citizens or non-Italian, non-European citizens living in Italy. Uh, the terminology changes from time to time, but, um, and, and uh, I organized this uh, workshop with my sister uh, who, who um, because um, there was like a lot of question about marketing. There were several uh, women, mostly uh, we we work uh, with, and they had question about marketing and digital marketing. And my sister was always someone that I felt like is doing really interesting work there. And she is also selling the stones work, like this jewelry with stones that she makes or artisan. Um, so I invited her uh, to share from her experience. And she also was, uh, she, she, she's been coaching artists for 16 years. Uh, she started this coaching for artists. And she just was about to finish. Uh, she said she's moving to kind of the stones and the astrology that she was into and kind of, and then I invited her. So she started speaking about the coaching and um, yeah, it was great. And there was something there about this artist inside, right? So. So the, the, she was sharing about how then she would have, she would say like, I, I only want to coach artists because that's, she, she was also a singer and wanting to, to work with artists. And, but sometimes clients would come that were not artists. And she said like, what, what happens is like in the first meeting, she, they would, it will be discovered that actually are artists, but they were 
hiding that part of themselves. So they actually had an artist, uh, you know, so they were, I don't know, painting, poetry, anything. There was, there was also an artist uh, hiding, <laughs> uh, but there was just like, also there is a lot of resistance with this word of artist, you know, the bad reputation, <laughs> um, you know, like you're thinking that you're supposed to go on hungry or, <laughs> I don't know, um, or also, you know, uh, there is like a general disrespect. So, um, and then, you know, also I, I shared there and I still share that for me, there is all sorts of way of being an artist um, so you you can, and I specifically love this kind of, there are people for me that are just li a li live living artists, you know, they, they don't exhibit or, but they just, they make their work, life into an artwork and they just, um, and that's for me like, like basically art. So, but yeah. Yeah, I love that. It's, yeah, I think. Yeah, I was reading a book that said the other day this too, like we, how reticent we are to call ourselves artists unless it's we're, we're, we're selling or we're performing or we're like we're being paid for it. So we think that means that then it's credible or that it's good, you know. So to your point, I think we all have that latent, it's not even latent, we have that, that artistry within us but because it's not you know, whatever metrics we use to describe, whether it's legitimate, then, we don't, then it doesn't talk about it. And I, so the, yeah, anyway, that, that, that came up for me, but it doesn't, I guess it doesn't surprise me then that so many of us have that, I think a real hunger to access some of those more in some ways primal feelings and um, ways of expression that don't fit neatly within some of these more especially very reason data driven sectors. Um, and I just can't do that anymore. I can't, I can't be in a space that doesn't allow for kind of my wholeness. It, it doesn't, I mean, not only does that feel authentic, it feels like a, like we can't as a society afford to, to quiet or to discriminate against or other these ways of, of being and showing up and, practicing our craft. So to add that, just looking at the side is my, my dog's yawning. It's, it's, a, it's a good life. I just want to touch what Uru was saying about uh, what some artists or insiders, some of us without knowing. <coughs> Sorry, last night, I'll tell a short story. Last night, um, one of my friends came to the show. He, he never done stand-up comedy before. He never performed in his life. Then, I don't know what makes him, he said to me, oh, can I do five minutes? I was like, are you serious? <laughs> He's like, yeah. I'm like, no, mate, no. And then he asked me, I said, okay, well, cool, I'll put you on the last one. When we're finished, you, do, you go to the last. Believe me or not, he really nailed it. <laughs> I was like, so this guy, personal, what I'm trying to say is he did not, he knew it had something inside him that he can perform, but it was always maybe scared of fear but yesterday his fear came out um so yeah i think um yeah all of us we have to find ourselves a how it works um but my 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 uh, show i run my own show like comedy show is it's about giving other people opportunities like yeah all the comedians who'd never been somewhere to the start there so it works it makes me feel great because I'm, I'm helping other people it's, you know what i mean like um since i started 2012 no yeah 12 then 2015 i set up that guy comedy show thousand and thousand comedians in scotland they went through my 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 door and black or white indian doesn't matter um wheelchairs uh, disabled everybody's and it makes me feel great i like i enjoy that feeling of like Actually, I'm, I'm sending people out there in the world to, to do more what they can do for themselves after that. Yes. Um, that's why I will never stop doing it. Um, yeah, it's like last night I told my friend, it gives me like this idea that there's so many of us um, that we need to be pushed in and do something. Like I'm, on the, mm -hmm. I'm waiting for um, a sign up. There's a new program in Scotland, in, in UK. They want to sponsor all, all the black comedians and Asian comedians only to come to Edinburgh Festival. 
So I'm, I'm on that list. So anytime if they say yes, oh man, that would be like, that's the dream I've been dreaming about for years, that to open that door, um, the, the venue is called Pleasance. It's a very famous venue, like all the famous comedians mm -hmm. perform there. So yeah, I'm just sharing this to say that um, I enjoy it, uh, actually to talk about art, art and all performance and stuff with other people. Even we are, even we are different, we are on the different levels. But having this conversation, I think is very important to, to yeah. yeah. I think that's that's it. Like if, you, if you got something maybe to to help me out to understand more, that'd be great. Yeah, oh, I love that. To your point, it's so interesting. You said that, and I agree with this. There's so many of us who need that push, especially around these around art and creativity. And the year you said on the on the flip side, some folks who are who might you know call themselves whether artists or creatives or whatnot, also want to be seen because they feel like their story, their narrative, their truth, their gifts are not being seen. It's like in, the, in the end, we, we all want to be seen. In some ways, that's a common denominator. And we want to feel like we can connect with one another. Um, and, and I do think the work, part of the work we do around well-being in the Institute uh, is about how do we, how do we create opportunities for genuine connection? And how do we how do we facilitate spaces where people can be themselves to, to drop as much as possible in this virtual space and without it feeling forced or contrived and recognizing psychological safety for people it can look and feel very differently. And how can we do that? Like, how can we create spaces? That I think it's be ourselves and when there is an insecurity or a desire that that has a place and doesn't have to be quieted or pushed to the side, but it's, it's important. So, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And I feel like, like this, having the stories being shared and expressed and being seen and creating the space for something like that to happen. Like I had just this experience, it was today, you know, it started last week <laughs> in the sense that what started is that the, uh, the teacher of my daughter uh, who is seven um, and we live in Italy and I'm originally from Israel, you know, from Jewish ancestry. She just reached out and kind of when we were out of the school and said that there's a, um, like International Holocaust Day, and you know, and and if I want, if I'm willing to speak with the school uh, about our story and family story, and and I said yes, um, <laughs> and like the, the rest of the week, I was like, what the hell I'm going to do? <laughs> I was like, I'm, it was like, uh, you know, it's an elementary school. Uh, it's 40 children. We're outside because you cannot be inside because of Corona and, um, you know, six to, to nine years old and, or yeah, six to 10 maybe. Um, and yeah, what, and, and, you know, and they obviously said like, try to, you know, not make it too dark. <laughs> uh, 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 of course, but and I didn't know, I, I had like a whole bunch of like workshop facilitation ideas about like timelines and journeys. And I, I until the last moment, I was like, I don't know what's going, what to do. Um, but in the end, what happened, and that was beautiful. I was, they were all sitting kind of in this shape, right on the floor in this garden of the school. And I came in with all my, notes of my ancestors kind of with their picture from our family tree and started talking and and then the teacher brought a chair and i just sat down and i started to share to share just being there and sharing and then the children came and they were also sharing stories so it was like i was like sharing the story and of some members of the family and then someone else came it's like my my grandmother this and you know my grandmother she they were also trying to hide Jews and and then they were also at risk and getting to concentration so her mother was grandmother was Polish and then someone else and you know Italy was a place where there was a lot of 
there was also this one of the last stories that was told was um, her grandmother again telling her that she was kind of put to the wall by a, a German soldier and then somehow an American soldier came and rescued her somehow uh, and you know so they're like and a lot of the kind of lot of stories right and um, and then some other children just came to share about are we all equal are we all different <laughs> should we all be different should we and yeah and I felt that at some point and that was kind of sort of my intention coming in because I I feel with this particular kind of story there is a and that was also part of my kind of what to do with that because I feel that it it becomes very kind of um, yeah a trap with kind of a one-sidedness kind of narrative and um, and I yeah I, it was beautiful how the space sort of opened for the students or children to share these family stories or just how they feel about stuff and and not being about me or or not only about me or or my family story, but opening the space for that sharing to happen in a way. Um, and yeah, and I, I feel that's like something I'm learning still, but like, it's really amazes me like, yeah, like, and you know, it, it's really a twist about all our idea about performing and being, for, you know, if, if in the end, the best performance is hosting the, collective conversation, then it changes what it means to be um, a performer in a way. <laughs> um, yes. Yes, please. It reminded me of something that we're thinking of, but please continue. I love this. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think maybe if I, and I'm trying to kind of connect that with the mentoring and maybe we, we start closing, mm -hmm. but I think like, also the collective well-being, you know, like um, yeah. what are the, so I think there is like certain something about meta skills that I'm discovering around facilitation and a dear friend saying maybe facilitation is not a profession, but it's a, uh, it's a, um, it's a skill for the leaders of the future. And, and, and then I, it went into what are the meta skills of facilitation and was listening. Um, and I'm thinking about this kind of level of meta skills or what do we need to cultivate in people and in groups in order to have like more collective well-being in your opinion or experience? Yeah, well, that's perfect because it ties in, I think, all of these things. So it yeah, you talked about the experience with your daughter and the, the school and how it became less of you, I don't say performative, but less about your, your being the dominant voice and it being about your family to one of a conversation where there's two directional learning, sharing a sense of connection. That's what we're thinking of at the Institute when it comes to education. So we're, while, I've been doing this work around the purposeful PhD and mentoring through a business separately. I come to find every day that actually, as we know, everything's connected. And so we are also interested in transforming education. And part of how we bring in then that hmm, sense of two-way learning is a couple of things. One, we dismantle the rule that says to be an educator you have to have a PhD, which is true in accredited, many accredited universities in the US or to have a, a master's degree, it depends on the field, um, but that you need some kind of advanced degree. We are asking who, who decided that? What made that necessary to be a really outstanding educator? And also who's, who's able to be a learner? We know about all the barriers to education, financial being some of them, but usually with higher education, you need one degree to then be able to apply for a higher higher level degree. It's like, it becomes these layers and layers of um, barriers from participating. And so some of the things we're thinking about are, how do we co-create and how do we design a program? We've been talking about the idea of a program around leadership for collective well-being. How do we do that in a way where we are kind of bringing together 
a whole suite of people with different stories, different backgrounds, skills, degrees, no degrees, it, it, frankly, it doesn't really matter to share that information. It, you know, it gets more complicated when we have to ask ourselves questions about, for example, accreditation, because we also know that for some people, a degree is, is, is a requirement for a job, you know, and that certain jobs require a accredited degree. How, so how do we disrupt that narrative? But to your question about meta skills, what I have found in our work to be true is that we've been told lately we have to do these really complicated things in order to be good leaders. And actually it comes back to things that we've known for all time. One that we support people to show up as who they are. What that means is that I am increasingly, a lot, I, I'm trying to, in some ways, model without putting myself on a pedestal, but model some of the things that used to scare me. In the past, I would never have had my dog in my office because God forbid my dog barks on a call and somehow that's a reflection of my professionalism. I'd always be behind like multiple walls anytime I was having a conversation or meeting whatnot. Now I'm, I encourage the dogs to be in my office. If they bark, so what? it makes me feel more human to have them here. And this is our lives. They're not quiet, they're noisy, they're chaotic. So that's, a, you know, so that is me embodying my authentic self as an invitation for other people to do the same. So promoting authenticity. Another meta skill is about what are the, what are the, so this is not just skill, but also what are the policies and practices of an organization? If we say we value parents, why do we continue to ask parents to parent full-time and work full-time during a pandemic, which many of us are doing? I'm doing that, I've done it. You know, Not at this moment, thank goodness, my kids are back in school, but the schools close all the time. They have to for safety reasons. So we're starting to talk about putting up on the days that we are parenting and working full-time, not working those days and putting up a an away message across the organization that says, if we really value parents, we don't ask them to parent as a job and also work as a job at the same time. It's a policy that says, we're not doing this to ourselves anymore. And we're not less credible and we're not worse professionals and we're not lazy. We're living our values. You know, so that's a thing where we are embodying the values that we talk about in ways that, um, are meaningful to us. Um, and maybe I'll think of one more of them because there, there are so many. One of them that I'm personally working on is being able to say hard things. What I mean by that is in organizations and in relationships, it's easy to give positive feedback. Everyone likes it. It's also for some people easy just to basically be a jerk and tell you that you suck or this was bad or the quality was lacking. But that's not helpful. So how, when something goes in a way that whether it feels, doesn't feel good, or it really, we agreed to something, it didn't happen. How do I talk about that in a way that isn't shaming or blaming, but is trying to really understand what's going on and how can we support that, that person? Or whereas, whereas what we thought was happening, bumping up against policies, we didn't realize they were as rigid as they are, blah, blah, blah. So working on having hard conversations and working through conflict, not avoiding it, that doesn't help us grow. So this is part of our work. Uh, we were just funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation actually to do a study of leaders throughout the United States who are um, working around, um, loosely speaking, collective well-being, the well-being of all people with a focus on people who are doing work related, especially that have a racial equity lens and that are place-based. Also looking at how is this work being done in the rest of the world because the United States is behind the eight ball when it comes to thinking about well-being. We are looking at exemplars, especially the ones that are happening, I was gonna say in Europe, because those are some of them that come to mind, but not just in Europe, all over the world. We have a lot to learn and we know it. Um, and those are exactly the the things we're trying to figure out. What makes for, what are the kind of leadership qualities, but even more so, I think, what's, what are the policies that govern organizational life that translates to a, like a demonstration of, of whether we care about people and if there's actually alignment between what we say 
than what we actually do. So um, definitely more to come. That's probably a whole other podcast just about that, but those are some of them that come to mind for me. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, just also, my daughter came back from school, <laughs> with, um, yeah. and 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 she she also passed some of the papers that I was passing around. So like, I didn't get the papers. <laughs> she was like, uh, they didn't pass the the paper to me as well. So now she looks. I didn't even pass all my. I have like a bunch load. I I printed like fifty pages, and I just passed two of them, um, in my kind of. Um, uh panicking about what the hell i'm going to do um (laughs) (laughs) but uh, yeah but i I, yeah but i I, yeah anyway i also here i I guess it's another podcast but i yeah thank you so much rebecca also like for this um authenticity and you really like bring that authenticity and like laid back and kind of the way you access that wisdom and and kind of curiosity it's yeah you're really modeling that and i think i think that's very useful and that's why I'm very excited that you're joining the mentoring program uh, as well um as um i don't know what um a mentor uh, uh researcher observer uh all of that and and more um and it's very emerging and um yeah, it's quite exciting. We have we have the first cohort starting uh, in Saturday, and Arawana Hayashi being the first kind of mentor teacher of the session. And yeah, and it's new. It's new, uh, but it's it's also not new. So I, I'm sure it will be great. Um, and 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 a lot of things will be growing out of it and through it. Um, so yeah, I think you're in the fifth session. So we'll have time to to see how it evolves um, uh, around the group. And uh, yeah, and also thank you, Nico, for for being part of the conversation and bringing your own kind of uh, uh, wisdom and and curiosity into every conversation. Uh, We'll try to get this uh, up on the podcast uh, even tomorrow. Um, um, Yeah, I don't know. Nico, do you want to share something? Or no, just um, just say thank you to Rebecca to, um, to hear you talking. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Nico. I told you my son's name is Nico, so I uh, <laughs> <laughs> love that, the connection. And I think I'll just say in, in that spirit of authenticity, I'm um, trying to model for myself what I want to be. It's hard. It's not we talked a little bit before we started recording that at a cellular level, it's hard to relax that drive that is so ingrained in all of us. It's not what I was taught. It's not what was modeled this idea of, well, in days that the kids are home, I'm not going to work. I mean, first of all, that's so privileged. And it's not the model that I was like, do both, keep going. But, you know, the truth is it, it results in burnout at best. And I, that's not the way that we as leaders um, can afford to continue doing this work. If it really is about well-being for ourselves and those in our communities and those in our organizations. So it's a work in progress, but thank you. I appreciate you seeing that in me and it's the work of a lifetime. Thank you. And, and, and I got inspired to, to take a bite of the, the, tasty oh. cake that just appeared near me and said like no it's i'm doing a podcast but i can still eat cake it's so uh, it's of allowed course you can. <laughs> <laughs> of course. oh my gosh yes to cake i love it <laughs> if you like the podcast like share and subscribe to the youtube channel support me in making the podcast on coffee slash imagine action subscribe to the podcast on spotify google podcast and apple podcast and stay tuned for the next episode.